So here's your chance to meet one of the most recognizable voices of all time, E.G. Daly. No. Oh, I don't know about that, Chucky. That's so cool. With characters like Rugrats, Tommy Pickles, the Powerpuff Girls, Curious George, and many, many more. Men, 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 yeah. menly men. Chances are, if you're between the ages of 18 and 40, you know exactly who I'm talking about. Today we're breaking down exactly how she built her empire, the very dark realities of working in the entertainment industry, and exactly how much money she made per episode as soon as you subscribe. And hit the like button, don't forget that, Jack. But first, we gotta thank today's sponsor, Delete Me. We have to talk about something that's increasingly more and more important in today's digital age, and that would be data privacy. We all know by now that our personal information is being bought and sold online by data brokers, which obviously puts all of our privacy at risk. Well, if you wanna remove that risk completely, I personally recommend today's sponsor, Delete Me. Delete Me helps you protect your personal data and keeps it private. They specialize in removing your personal information from data broker websites so you can have peace of mind knowing that your sensitive details aren't floating all over the internet. Look, I've experienced it firsthand when your data gets out there that you don't want getting out there. It's private information. You don't want everyone to have access to it. I've been there. But with Delete Me, I could take control of my online presence and protect myself from all of those different risks. Delete Me even has a team of privacy experts who help take care of everything for you. So protect yourself and stay private with Delete Me. Check out joindeleteme.com slash ICH20 to get 20% off all consumer plans or just use the code ICH20 at checkout. Again, the link is down below in the description to get started today. And now with that said, let's get back to the podcast. Thank you so much for coming You're on the welcome. podcast. It, it's going to take me probably five minutes. To, Graham is uh, starstruck. This I doesn't happen am. often. No, what was no, it no. that you wanted to do this interview with me about? Which... Like, which particular thing was it? Well, for, I, well I think everything. But yeah. for me, it was so full circle because I grew up on Rugrats. Okay. Like, as a kid, like, nonstop reruns. Like, my parents would hear the theme song <laughs> over and over and over again. I saw the Rugrats bum, movie. Bum, 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 yeah. Bum, bum, bum. And so... I didn't tell, my mom would get a kick out of this, but I didn't tell her that I was doing this with you because I was just like afraid. I'm afraid of jinxing things. I'm like, well, what if like, you know, because of the rain, like people don't show up or have to reschedule. Like if something were to come up, I don't want to get my hopes up. Your yeah. mom would freak out too. She would lose it. Like absolutely lose it. I gotta it. go. <laughs> <I'm very busy. laughs> She's gotta go. But you did so many voices, I think mm -hmm. for like my entire generation grew up cool. hearing you. So it's just weird to like, be here across the table from you is 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 don't mind come blowing. too close. Is mind blowing. There's but, a line right here. <laughs> all right, I'll keep my distance. I promise. <laughs> He's been I'll looking behave. forward to this for a very I'll very see. long time. I'll, I'll behave. See. I first really found your content separate from like Rugrats and everything on TikTok. Mm -hmm. I think through the pandemic, yeah. I saw you and your daughter yeah. posting videos together. I'm like, yeah. wow, this is so I cool. I have two daughters, so we would do them together. Or yeah, I think it was Hunter. Yeah, yeah, Hunter Daily. Yeah, and so that's how I started following you on like just separate from everything else. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you have a really cool story to tell about how you got into voice acting. Uh, if you could go into a little bit about your background, like how you got started in that and like growing up to begin with. I didn't really come from a family that knew anything about entertainment. You know what I mean? Like it, I wasn't, I wasn't like, I didn't have an uncle or cousin who was like a big director. Or I didn't have any nepotism. Mm -hmm. There was no connection to anything in Hollywood. But my family, all I knew was that my mom was really loved the whole Hollywood thing because she was like an immigrant. So she mm -hmm. had no connection to it, but she had this thing where she just loved it. You know, she loved music and she loved. So I think starting off, like, I, I think I always thought, like, well, how am I going to do this? Like, I really didn't know how I was going to do it. But I think she sort of saw that I had certain things about me that might have been, like, magical. I think my mom saw the magical part of me. And, um, and I don't know how it happened. Just, like, one thing led to the next. And then I, like, as a little girl, I got an agent. And then I just sort of allowed things to sort of flow. You know, things just started flowing. So I really have to say, like, I look back at my career and I just go, wow, I can't believe I've done all this work. And sometimes it feels like I haven't done any work because mm -hmm. I'm like, I can't, so much time goes by and I'm like, wow, I can't believe I did that. And I did Saturday Night Live and I did American Bandstand. I did Rugrats. I did Powerpuff Girls. I did Hughes Week Adventure. I did, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I just think I just keep walking forward and then new yeah. opportunities keep coming. And I try not to grab too hard onto one of the past things because if I grab too hard to the past things, then I won't see what's up in front of me. Like sometimes it'll be so... Um, stuck on something that I did that I want to keep doing. And then sometimes these magical things like voiceover just happened. It's mm -hmm. just like I did a play and someone said, you could do this. So if I were just looking back all the time, it's like, no, I'm an actress, I'm a singer. And I wouldn't have been open to this opportunity that came yeah. up. So 
I don't know how to say it started. It just started like random. What was magical as a kid? Like what were some of the things that they looked at and said like, ah, it's not normal. Like there's maybe some talent here. I think I was just really good at singing and um, dancing, like just innately. I think mm-hmm. I had that. And I started writing songs as a little girl. Like I literally picked up a little guitar book when I was eight or nine and taught myself to play guitar. And we didn't have YouTube. So I taught myself, I started singing and watching singers and mimicking singers. And then I started taking lessons. I was good at it. I mean, I was yeah. just, I could do it. I could do like, I could imitate sounds. I could imitate voices. Do you think it's Is just it, like a biological difference in you that most people don't have where you can mimic voices? Or do you think it was something that kind of just like fostered over time after lots of practice? I think like some people have this weird ear and they can mimic and imitate sounds. And some people have no idea how to do it. And I think because I sing, I can hear like someone say something like, Hey, what are you doing? And then I can, they can say, can you sound like that boy? And I'd be like, Hey, what are you doing? And I could do it exactly yeah. like that. Like two and a half men, you know, the thing. Yeah. Like, so, you know, I do that. Yep. So that was one of those things where they were like, can you take Jake's voice? And then can you sing like you were him? Cause we need the singer for the opening of two and a half men mm-hmm. and he doesn't sing. So we need somebody that sort of sounds like him. So I was like, okay, send me a recording of his voice. And he was just like, Cheryl, what are you talking about? You know, he sort of talks like that yeah. when he was a little kid. He was sort of chubby and he sort of was like talk slow. And then all of a sudden, like, can you sing like him? So I'd go, you know, men, 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 yeah. menly men. So it's like, I think I just have the ear for it. Just like you might be really good at real estate. Yeah. Innately. Like there's certain things we have innately. Some people are really good at organizing. Like my other assistant, she can literally, I can put her, put her to a closet with like tons of vitamins and things in boxes and I can come back in like 20 minutes and everything is beautifully lined up. Mm. I can't do that. But I just think everybody has their little magical things. And I yeah. think my magical thing was limitless when it came to my voice, like literally limitless. I could do like any kind of voice, any kind of um, age range, like I do age ranges and little kids, little girls, little boys, chubby, chubby kids. Yeah. Um, genius kids, smart boys, you know, whatever it is, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Little girls, little tiny girls, little baby girls, <laughs> babies. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's just like, it's infinity. Yeah. Right. On top of that, I really applied myself to being really good at those things. Mm-hmm. So I didn't just rely on my innate talent. I relied on, um, I studied like I was, my game was like, be as good as I could. Mm-hmm. And that meant every aspect of it. I meant like, be great know how to play guitar. So I taught myself, know how to write music. So I'd listen to great writers. I just studied, I studied a lot. And I see think the combination between what I actually could do as a gift and then what I, how much I applied myself, I was relentless. How did your parents foster that growth? Because it seems like they were very supportive and, and nurturing of like letting you explore that and, and get really good at that. They didn't do music. They didn't do like instruments. They, they owned a fencing company. Mm-hmm. They built fences and window grills. You know, and so I think what she she'd do was she'd go to thrift stores and yard sales and uh, flea markets and she'd pick up instruments and she'd see like some weird instrument she'd throw it in the house. And one of the five kids would pick it up and start playing it. Mm. And I sort of did all of it. I was the one that would like pick up trying to sing and pick up trying to play that instrument so I could play like a little harmonica, a little drums, a little guitar, a little piano, a little. You know what I mean? I picked them all up and my brothers and sisters all did too, but just more, more limited. Even my brothers and sisters will say that when I was born, it was almost like, she was like, this is my (laughs) little, this is going to be, you know, which also put a lot of pressure on me, to be honest. Like I felt it, but I really do feel like I felt it from my mom, whatever that was that she saw was, I think what gave me a little push and, um, and also made me be a little sensitive to other people and wanting, uh, that's where my people pleaser comes in. I want everybody to feel special. Did uh, your parents ever put any pressure on you to, to go for more of like a, a normal career or like we want you to be a doctor or Never. a lawyer or they want you to... I think like because they came with from nothing, Yeah. what I did was miraculous yeah. to them. You know, I don't think they had any expectations yeah. of any of us and of any of the five kids in my family. Like my sister is a brilliant painter. She goes by Ren River and she's a brilliant painter. She's like a master painter mm. and she's sold paintings all over and she's been in magazines and... I don't think they could have ever expected that. Do you think that some of that is because growing up in Venice, that that is a very eclectic culture of people where I think creativity is really rewarded? They weren't really, I don't think they knew what Venice was either. Sure, I think okay. back then there was yeah. even that kind of culture about it. There was sure. just 
that's where they landed when they came here and they okay. could get one room that they could all fit into. Yeah. So I don't think they had any concept of the Venice culture yet because Venice culture is so... Different now. back then. Yeah, it was yeah. very different back then. And they've been here like, I don't know, 40, 50 years. Wow. Yeah. So when did you first yeah. get into to voice acting? You kind of alluded to it in the beginning. Did you initially try to become a voice actor? Was it like no. different types of acting? And when did you secure your first agent? So I was just an actress. Mm -hmm. You know, I started getting an agent when I was a kid. Like I had commercial agents when I was eight. And was that you that initiated that whole process? No. Or? My mom got me an agent mm. and I had a best friend who was like a child model, my friend Michelle. And she was like this beautiful little girl and she had a commercial agent. And so my mom was like, let's get you a commercial agent. So I hated it. I thought it was like awful because you had to be really fake pretty much. It was like, hi, my name's Michelle. I'm a so-and-so agency. And I was just like, I can't do that. Do you know what I mean? It felt really like contrived to me. Mm. But she still got me this agent and I went on these commercial auditions and I didn't understand why I never booked any of them. I just thought, okay, I guess you just go on these auditions and you don't book them, you just go on them. And then um, I think it wasn't until I was like 15, after like I got when I was eight and when I was 15, I got my first job. Like 15 was like a guest star on a Laverne and Shirley episode. My mom sort of started me and there was, finish your question. But you were, you were in on. commercials between the ages of eight and 15, I correct? didn't really, I did, one, let me think, I did one commercial. Hmm. Um, I think when I was 14 for a Pepsi Cola commercial, it was like a national commercial. I don't know how I booked it, but I did one commercial and then I booked Laverne Shirley and then I guest starred on like Fame and then I guest starred on Chips and Bay City Blues. And then that, that was my, I started working, you know, in acting when I was about 15, 16, 17. But how is your agent sustaining themselves? I didn't have the over, same. Oh, it was different agents. I'm wondering like if it's oh. six years, they don't get a single oh, booking yeah, no, for no, their no. client. Yeah, I didn't have, I didn't get any work that whole time. Okay. I don't even know how I ended up booking what it, how, when I switched agents. Because I was just a kid. Yeah. I was yeah. like, hey, the Pepsi Cola commercial, I should have never got because they were like, can you, I was very ethnically ambiguous looking, you know? I think probably because I had more of my brown hair. It was kind of my Jufro hair and, sure. you know, wild and you know mm -hmm. hippie looking. And I think um, they said, go to this Pepsi Cola commercial. And they were like, can you sail a catamaran? Can you get, do you know how to be on a catamaran? And I was like, yes, because they said, just say yes to everything. Yeah. And I said, yes, I can. And then I think because of my ambiguous <laughs> look, they mm -hmm. like that. They like that ethnically ambiguous I got it and then then I was like sitting on a beach and they're like okay you're gonna go in and I was like holy shit I have to go on <laughs> so I didn't know what I was doing I should have never probably booked that but I did and I had to drink a lot of diet a lot of coke and it was um, coke or pepsi I was pepsi sorry okay. <laughs> okay. but before we go into that I know how overwhelming it could be to see all the equipment that's out there and think oh I gotta spend thousands of dollars to get started up but thankfully our sponsor, StreamYard, is there to help. So StreamYard is a live streaming studio platform that helps you create high quality content with just the click of a button. All you need is any camera and an internet connection and you can start streaming directly from your browser. What I really like though is that you could stream to multiple social media platforms all at the same time. So you could set it up once and then stream to YouTube, to Twitch, to Instagram, and so on. Basically almost anything out there, you're gonna get your face out there. StreamYard is the best way to start creating content online and best of all, they also offer for a free package so you guys could get started today at the cost of zero. And look, leveling with you guys, they've also been a huge supporter of the podcast and have allowed us to take a lot of trips and travel to some of the guests that we otherwise just wouldn't have really seen. So if you guys appreciate that and want to support us and have something that's totally free, visit StreamYard down below in the description to get started today. Thank you so much, StreamYard. We love you. And back to the episode. Right after I got out of high school, like everybody was going to colleges. Yeah. And then where it said my name, there was no college. I wasn't going to go to college. That wasn't like my, my parents were not those parents that were like, you go to college, you become a doctor, you go to college. Again, they had no expectations. Were you academic? No, not at all. I'm a terrible speller right now. Even today, I'm embarrassed. Like when I write something, I have to have somebody proofread because I'm terrible at it. Hmm. But um, I think there were no expectations. Yeah. So I didn't go to college. Hmm. I just knew that I was going to start working. And that was maybe the magic my mom saw. Mm -hmm. She saw that part of me that was like, I'm going to make this happen. You're paving your own road. I paved my own road. And just out of curiosity with this Pepsi Cola commercial, I'm wondering like, <laughs> how, really digging in yeah, this how long did it take? Like, do you just I show up to a, the beach? Was it a full day shoot? It was a, I think it was one or two days. Wow. Full days. And do you remember how much they paid for I it? I don't. Like, I really don't. Because I'm thinking like Pepsi, they probably got a pretty sizable it was a, budget. It was, a, it was a national Pepsi commercial. Do you get big, royalties on that? 
And I, I would. I'm pretty sure I did back then. Wow. They yeah. stopped airing it though. Oh yeah. yeah it was yeah. like. <laughs> otherwise, it had been like yeah, back in the old, back in the olden days. Yeah. <laughs> That's what you call it. But yeah. How were you supporting yourself after high school? It's a big uh, jump not to go to school and to go out and like begin working. I think it was those those few jobs I started getting. I mean, I had a couple recurring things on Fame, and then I did Bay City Blues, some TV show, and then I did um, Chips. Then I did. I started working like booking little guest stars and things, and then I I started booking features. Like I did this one feature called The Escape Artist, I think, and that was a Francis Ford Coppola film with Griffin O'Neill and Desi Arnaz Sr. and all these really classic people that were in it. Then I booked that movie, and somehow I became, I don't even know how that happened. I went from never booking a job to, like, all of a sudden there were castings of, like, we're looking for an Elizabeth Daly type. And I'd be like, I'm right here. Mm-hmm. I'm right here, you know. And then I was wondering why they wouldn't just call me. They were looking for a type like me. Why wouldn't they call you directly? Sometimes I thought they, I think they didn't think I would be available. Oh, wow. That happens a lot. <clears throat> it's really weird. Um, yeah. So... Yeah. Wow! I and, just I started yeah. earning my own money, and um, and it was sustainable to, immediately outside of high school. Some, for some reason, it was. I don't because I didn't. I had like, um, like at fifteen, I worked in an ice cream parlor, but I only worked there because there were cute boys, and I was like, oh, there's cute boys here. And get <laughs> that was the only reason why I got that job. And Did then, you end up making one of the cute boys your boyfriend? Probably. No. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that sort of was my thing. That was the guiding light for me. It was like where. <laughs> that's <laughs> funny yeah i was boy crazy yeah so still am i think anyway um uh, man crazy anyway uh, yeah so that's it and how did that progress because i think you were you were n- not really doing any voice acting at that point so how did that then transition into voice acting into voice acting so i was starting to do a lot of movies right if you look at my IMDb page, there's mm-hmm. like a lot of wacky, interesting movies. A lot of them. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, I get a call from a guy named Bruce, who is a friend of mine that I'd known, who's a producer. And he said, oh, um, we have this play that was on Broadway called Tansy. And it starred Deborah Harry on Broadway. And it was a musical. And it was about a female wrestler. You have to be able to sing. You have to be physically fit. So I'm like, that's right up my alley. I, I wasn't always working out and I'm a singer. And, uh, you know, and it's a musical. So I love that. And so I said, I'll do it. And opening night at the Roxy, um, a lot of record labels came. So I got a major record deal from it. I was just singing like a couple of songs in the play, but I got a massive record deal on a and And some guy came and handed me this card and said, you should really do voiceover. You're really good at it. Because in the play, I had to be a female wrestler. But each round of the wrestling, I had to be a different age. So I had to go from being a baby, a, fi- a baby in the first round. Like they put me in a baby dress and a big diaper and with a thing on my head and a rattle. And I was like, <laughs> and I just was a baby girl. And then I had to be like, hi, I'm Tansy, a five-year-old girl. And then I had to be a 10-year-old to talk like this. And then I had to be a 16-year-old. And then I had to be a grown-up. So I yeah. had to age myself. And he saw that. And he was like, wow, you're really good at these voices. And you're really good at children's voices. Again, this was that weird gift that I had that I could imitate and huh? mimic. And then, so this guy handed me a card opening night. And he said, I'm a voice agent. You should really pursue this. And I was kind of like, hmm. part of me was like, I'm not a cartoon. I don't. I never thought like I'm gonna be a famous cartoon one day, but I did call him because I talk about um, offshoots. When I I talk about a thing called offshoots, where like if you get a tap on the, you're going this way. Yep. And you're very clear. Mm-hmm. And then you get a tap on the shoulder, like you should try this here. And I'm like, oh no no no, I don't do that. I only do this. But I was like. I really believe that part of the reason why my career has been so phenomenal with so many different, um, I've done so many different types of things between music and acting and movies and cartoons is because I listen to the little tap on the shoulder, which is like, I think, the God voice. Mm-hmm. And it was like, you should, you should come see me at this office and try this voice thing. And at first I was like, I really want to do a card, you know, voices. But I did go to his office one day and I did go on my first audition with this agent. And my first audition, um, I booked. And that was Tommy Pickles on Rugrats, hmm. at which became, changed my life. Yeah. Changed the trajectory of my whole, like, all of a sudden I started getting all these cartoons and it was like Huey Dewey Louie and Powerpuff Girls and Jungle Cubs and Rugrats and like my whole career. And not only was that perfect, but I was having babies during that time. 
right? Mm-hmm. So I was able to be pregnant and work the whole time. There's like Rugrat episode with me in labor during Rugrats. I'd be like, no. oh, I don't know about that, Chucky. Oh, please. And I'd be like, no. And I'd be like, okay, I'm better. Let's go. Yeah. And then I'd do it again. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So they actually have me in labor on Rugrats. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, we'll get to that in a second, but. <laughs> What made you... That's how you, my career. Is that what you started? Yeah. Sometimes I go on tangents. So no, it's yeah, great. Yeah. You just have to reel me back to the point. What made you say yes to that? Uh, because you seem very focused on going one direction. What made that different that day? To the cartoon? Yeah. I think he was so clear that I had a real gift with the thing. Again, there's that gift thing. He goes, I think you're really good at this. Like, your ability to do children's voices and, and age your voice up was really good. Mm. That's what he said. And I was kind of like... You know, to me, it was like, and I always say it's like people flipping their eyelids over. They don't realize it's a weird gift Mm -hmm. or that weird double jointed thing. People go like this and their joints pop up. Oh, yeah. Do you do that? Not really. Don't do it. Yeah, I can't really. Yeah. yeah. I think it was just um, he saw in me the ability to mimic and sound so much like a kid that he was like, you you should really pursue this. And, And I trusted um, yeah, I trust him. I just said, okay, I'll, I'll go on an audition with you. And I just went with it. Hmm. And it was like, it was one of those yeses that I think changed my life. Now you mentioned offshoots. Yeah. How do you know when to say no? Um, Cause you can't just say yes to everything and no, then you're you just overloaded. But how do you make that distinction? It's a really tricky line. Like it really is. So it's just yeah. a gut feeling. Is it usually like, something you have to okay. think about or is it kind of just like, okay, I know what my answer is. Sometimes it's like, hell yeah. <laughs> in my body, like, oh hell yeah, that feels good. But like the voiceover thing wasn't a hell no, but it was like there was some uncertainty, but there was curiosity. So I sort of said, maybe I'll check it out. Yeah. You know, it was what, curiosity. What was that like auditioning for Rugrats? You had no idea what it was at the time. So what was that process like? What did they have you do? I went to this little Nickelodeon recording thing and it was my first audition. I didn't, almost didn't go because I was having my carpet replaced in my condo that day. So I almost was like, ah. Uh. They're changing the carpet in my place. I'll get you on the next one. <laughs> and he was like, mm, I think you should go in, you know, go ahead and try it. And this agent was a little pushier. Yeah. And he said, no, I think you should try it. And I was like, mm, no, I'll get you on the next one. And he was just enough pushy that I was like, okay, guys, I'm just going to the corner. I'll be right back. I just told the guys that were working for me, like, basically don't rob for me. I'll be right back. I'm coming back in 10 minutes, but really it was like an hour. Sure. And I just, um, and I just ran there and I just, uh, read this audition and I had no idea what I was doing because I'd never done a cartoon, but I just read the lines as a character that I think as a little girl, I always did like little baby voices. And I thought that, that picture, they showed me a claymation. I was like that, that claymation, like the mouth on that claymation looks like the voice I've been doing my whole life, which was like, Oh, Michelle, let's go, let's go get ourselves a snack. What do you say? You know what I mean? And, you know, and I just looked and I thought the way his mouth was and the way my mouth sounds and just something about it. And I did that voice. And then I was like, I can't be here very long. I got to go. And they were like, okay, we're almost done. I was the first person. Mm -hmm. So they kept making me wait. They kept sending producers in. And I was just like, I got to go. And then I I was completely ignorant as bliss. I had no idea. And there were people waiting to read after me, but they kept bringing new producers in, like in the booth. And I was watching more and more people come in because I guess they were just like, she's it. And I didn't know that. And I got home and my agent called and said, you, they really love you for that show. And to be honest, I was actually a replacement because then another girl who did Tommy Pickles and I had to come in, they decided it wasn't the right voice. Mm -hmm. And I had to come in and redub all of her voice for an entire season. And then I, I, I booked it and that was like, you know. No. Now, did they have you audition for other characters like Chucky or f- no. it was just Tommy Pickles? Yeah. Did they have everyone else already locked in on the other voices? Yeah, because they'd already done a whole season. Oh, that's right. With the girl that wasn't. There. So they did the entire season, but didn't like the way Tommy Pickles voice sounded. That kind of stuff can happen where you can do a record and then they go, eh, we're not feeling it. What were your initial impressions of the show? Like when they pitched the idea, did you think oh, this is going to be a hit or like what, what? were your first thoughts going zero, into it? Remember, I was getting carpet put in my condo. Yeah. That's all I was thinking about. <laughs> thinking, but what about when they say, you you got it? Like, this is yours if you want it. I was like, really? I really was just like, every time I, sorry, every time I book a voice cartoon, every time, and I started booking everyone I'd, 
I'd read for it, I'd book it. I'd read another one, I'd book it. <laughs> I was literally doing eight seasons a week. I was doing eight different shows all week long. Like I'd go from a Jungle Cups to a Rugrats to a Powerpuff Girls to a... I was literally going day to day to, to a different series on a different network or... It was a lot of work. Is there any like conflict of interest? Like does not Powerpuff really. Girls not want you being a voice That's on something That's what else? you would think. You would no. like sign an exclusive. No. Just like, no? No, because I'm doing that voice for them and I'm doing Tommy for somebody else. And I'm, nobody can own you in, in voiceover. Really? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. I feel like the producers would smarten up because they would want like just, because you're so good at what you do mm-hmm. that just like we want her and that's it. They can't no have one else. because I'm infinity. I'm, I'm, I do in, an infinity amount of voices. So yeah. how, how can they prison me in one place when I, I'm like water? Yeah. I'll go everywhere. Sure. You can't just put me, you know, you can't just say water to stay here. I mean, I'm going to go everywhere. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I do. So how did it work when you were filming? Would they have you go into the office? For and Rugrats? Just, yeah, for Rugrats. They would have the babies go in together. So like um, Chucky, Phil, Lil, uh, Tommy um, would all be together and do our voices. And then like Angelica would go in on her own usually because mm-hmm. they would have the babies because we did so many of our lines together. So it'd have us together. So when we first started doing Rugrats, it would take a lot longer. It would take like six hour sessions. Nowadays, you never take that long. Mm-hmm. I go in and I do... Four episodes in one hour, in two hours, one to two hours, all by myself. Because I'm not waiting for everybody to get their lines right. I'm just doing wow. my lines. Wow. So you could get through an entire like se- season or... Pretty quick. Wow. Yeah, pretty quick. And how does how does pay work with voiceover acting versus being like physically on screen? I mean, right. Like voiceover acting is like you just leave when people start doing a show. It's just like a scale rate. Sure. It's pretty much the same with on camera. Like you'll get a scale rate. I don't know what scale is for on camera, but it's, it's probably similar for a full day. Whereas you go and do a voiceover and it could take you 10 minutes. Mm. You'll make the same $1,200 or whatever the scale rate is. If it's SAG as you might for a full day on the set. So it's kind of pretty lucrative when you do voiceover because you have so much time. Right. And, um, but then when you have a show that becomes a hit, the money starts growing. So let's say you have a show that goes for six years. Like Rugrats didn't start raising their money until maybe six years in. And then they were like, our show is pretty popular. We're going to raise the amount you guys are getting. So you're now you're going to get double scale or you're going to get triple scale. And then it would jump from like this amount to like all of a sudden around season nine, mm-hmm. 10, it would go from like, oh, you're making two grand, three grand to like, 30 grand or some crazy. Wow. Yeah. So you could per episode. Yeah. You were, you could make really big money per episode. I mean, Simpsons, like I'm good friends with Nancy who plays yeah. Chucky on Rugrats and the Simpsons are making like, I don't know. This is where they were making. I like, heard something that like a hundred thousand, 200,000 oh, plus an episode. Right? I think it's more well, for that. Nancy. Yeah. Yeah. If, yeah. For some of those people, it's like crazy money. So animation can be very lucrative because it's the same thing. They have a show on primetime. Yeah. They're making money, so why isn't aren't these star actors that are now known making the money? So, I mean, there's a there's a lot of money to be made in voiceovers if you can have a show that lasts long enough to go into yeah. big money and syndication. And if it's prime time, that's where the money is. Yeah. If it's just like um, syndication, not syndication, but if it's like streaming or it's all different now because there's so many venues. There's like there's so many different platforms, you know, streaming and like whatever. Yeah. It's different money now. So if you go in and you record one episode and it's 30K, how long does that take you? Well, back then, I think I was still working with a lot of the cast members. And when you'd, like I said, when you're working with everybody in the booth, you're waiting in between your lines so that each person gets each line right that they Mm -hmm. want. So it could take four hours back then. Uh, But right now you could go in and do your, the same work. You could go in for, do an episode. It's, it's not like right now we're doing Rugrats again. It's not quite, it's not what it was back then mm-hmm. because they came in like 14 years later and renegotiated and they wouldn't negotiate back to that rate. Right. They have to start it as a brand new show kind of. We didn't go brand new show rate, but it wasn't like that rate. You know, it was like, yeah. it wasn't here, but it wasn't here. Did you feel like you had more leverage before the six years of, of Rugrats to increase your pay? Or did it take six years to really take off? Because It kind of took that long to yeah. take off. Because what mean, cause it, it, you started, I think it was 1989 or 1990 was the first. I don't know. I don't remember the date. Okay. Yeah. 
I remember my own birthday sometimes. Yeah. No. <laughs> right before you. Yeah. I don't know if you watch the show Ned's Declassified. No. On Nickelodeon. Yeah. He he was saying that even after three seasons, they were very much apt to say, well, if you don't like the pay, you could leave and we'll replace you very easily. And that was their mindset. But I feel yeah. like with something like Rugrats, very difficult to replace the voice because it always sounds a little different. It like does. you could never yeah. get it quite the same. Usually when you go in on a show like that, like when they came back and said, we want to do Rugrat reboot because now we're on season two of a brand new reboot. Mm-hmm. You really don't want to be greedy. Sure. You, you really don't. You don't want to play that card because they could replace you. There, there's, it's always possible. What you want is a really beautiful, um, harmonious uh, win for everyone. Mm-hmm. So I think when it came to when we all got asked back, and they didn't invite all the adult characters back, they recast a lot of those characters. Some people didn't get recast, but the um, the main baby characters all came back. But when that happened we had to come together as a group, the, all the babies and say, well, what do we think is fair without being greedy and saying, we're not going to do it unless you give us $5 million yeah. an episode. You know, we had to be really, um, have integrity to the whole sure. show, not just think about ourselves. Like we want to let's just try to break them for as much money as we can. Yeah. And so I think we all came together and thought they offered a certain amount. And then we all came together and said, well, what's a fair amount. That's not crazy. And not greedy. And also a little win for mm-hmm. us. And that's where we came up with a number that felt beautiful to Nickelodeon as well. And then it's a big win. So you can't just you can't just go for like, you know, yeah, you just can't. You can't. Uh, no. You want to you do the right thing. Because I've seen people get booed. Here's an example. So Babe, you know the movie Babe and mm-hmm. Babe 2? Okay, so Babe the Pig. I was Babe yep. the Pig and Babe Pig of the City, the second one. The first one had... Actually, Christine Kavanaugh, who's a brilliant actress, voice actress, who was the original babe, she actually did Chucky on Rugrats. Hmm. Um, she started as Chucky on Rugrats. So I already knew her. I was working with her. And she was babe in the first babe. And then what happened was they came time to negotiate um, Babe Pig in the City, the sequel to Babe. And they went to her and her agent said, this is what we have <laughs> for you for Babe 2. And her rep, or whoever it was, her lawyers, her rep, was like, no. We can't, we want way more. We want more. And then they couldn't, they said, we don't have any more for this. This is our budget. We would love you to do it. This is our budget. And then whoever it was, the powers that be in in that team said, no, we want more. And they came to me and said, will you audition for this role? And at that point I had to say, I'm not auditioning for that role because she's my friend. I work with her on Rugrats and we don't, we can't do that. I'm not going to step in. And so I didn't. And Mm. But I said, but I'd love to audition for this other role, um, this little monkey. And they were like, okay. So then what happened was this time passed. They cast, recast her because they never settled on an amount. Mm. And or whatever this happened, time passed. They didn't settle with her. They negotiated with somebody else. I got cast as this other character, the monkey, the little boy. And then a week before we were recording, I get a call. I'm literally sitting on a beach and I get a call from George Miller. The director says... E.G., we've been listening to the tapes. We already recast the character, so it's not like you'd be stepping on anyone's toes. We think you're babe for this, and would you be interested in doing it now? And at that point, I was like, yeah, I would. So I said yes at that point because I knew I didn't, um, I didn't have a lack of integrity to my sure. friend and to doing the right thing for people that you work with, and so then I got cast as that character. Hmm. And yeah. So you can get booted out. That's my point. Even okay. on a giant feature like that, hmm. if you don't play the right cards. How do you take care of your voice if you're doing multiple shows? It's nice that it's let's say four to six hours in a day mm-hmm. for an episode. Mm-hmm. It means you could do maybe two, a, you know, two in a day. Mm-hmm. But how do you ensure that you don't strain your voice in one episode so that you go to the next one? It's like you can't do the other show. I think <laughs> I've been doing so much stuff with my voice for so much of my career. I mean, I'm a singer. I think my voice is so conditioned for so much. I like, I'm a bodybuilder. Like my, like some people are like, I just think I'm like a bodybuilder when it comes to my vocal cords or my ability to push my voice. Mm -hmm. It's kind of rare that I can't, you know, the only kinds of things that would really mess my voice up are if I have a really, really severe chronic bronchitis cough and it just kind of gives me a little laryngitis, which is pretty rare even. Mm -hmm. And I'm still able to push myself past that to do certain, like 
Tommy because even if I was like talking like this and I had like a really hoarse voice, I still could go, oh, that's so cool, you know, and I could just squeeze I it. smile every time you do that. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I <laughs> just push it right over it. And so it happens. So, wow. Yeah. Now, you were saying you were in labor, also doing the voice of Tommy Pickles. How, how does that work? Can you, can you works, f- do this from home or is no, it like... No, I was, I was in the studio in- and I had gone to the doctor because I was, I was very pregnant. Yeah. And I said, I feel like I'm in labor. And that doctor that I stopped using after that particular incident, I didn't no longer use that doctor. Somebody else came in because the doctor never made it to labor, I don't think. But I basically, um, I went to the doctor's and said, I think I'm in labor. And they're like, no, you're fine. And I was like, okay. And my, my kid's dad was like trying to take care of me because he could see I was like struggling with contractions. And I just went ahead and went to work. And I just like, yeah. Went. How long does labor start before birth? It can vary. It can be like, you can kind of be in labor for two days having like the contractions start coming faster and faster, which contractions feel like, um, like just pain. Like it just gets really, like it's almost like your belly hardens for a second and then it relaxes. And it's a really weird feeling. feels like cramps. But you're not a girl, so you don't know what cramps feel like. It's like that. You know when you have a really good ab day, Jack, and, you're, and your abs just kind of I don't like, do It's not day. even like that. Like, it's like porn. girl cramps. It feels like cramps, but it gets very extreme. I've gotten, um, what do you call it? It's a cramp, right? And like your calf cramp? Yeah, where it spasms yeah. out. It kind of feels yeah. like in a weird way, like it All gets right. hard and it's weird. That's what a okay. certain, they're called Braxton Hicks's feel like. It kind of gets really, your belly will actually contract and gets really hard and it kind of hurts. It's kind of like a cramp in a way, but it's a little different. Okay. It's like kind of in your... See, yeah, I didn't know if this was happening like right before you're about to give birth or if this I, was It like... had been happening for a few days. And wow. That can happen. You can start having contractions, but not be in labor. Mm-hmm. And you don't go into labor until you're dilated a certain amount. Your body's gotten so, so big inside. And so I guess I went to the doctors and he was like, no, you're fine. But I was having so many contractions. I was like, how can I just be fine? I think I'm in labor, but I just, I listened to the doctor and then... I just went to the work and which was probably better too because I wasn't sitting at home thinking about it. Right. I just went to work. And my job wasn't like, oh, I have to go run a marathon or I was like sitting in a chair doing voices. And they were very patient with me. They were like, Oh, you're having another one of those. <laughs> and they were like, Wow, these are you're having them pretty often. I was yeah, like, yeah. Every two minutes. Okay. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> yeah. That's when you know you're in labor. Because you can have <laughs> Braxton Hicks contractions, but they might be like every hour. And you're not in labor yet. How long does a contraction take? It's like it lasts like 20 seconds. Oh, maybe. wow. That, I, see, I thought it was going to be 10, like a, a maybe two second yeah, thing. No, it's kind of no, like... No, 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 no. So maybe t- wow. 10 seconds. I don't know. I got to remember. It's been a while. <laughs> I'd have to get pregnant again. <laughs> 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 so yeah, it's a really weird thing. But I was like, I just was like, okay. So I went to work, which I would have probably done anyway. And then after work... It was the crew in the studio that was like, you're having a lot of contractions very close together. People that were moms that were in the booth were like, when your contractions start happening, like every two minutes, three minutes, you're getting closer to have, being in labor. And then that night I had a baby. So I was- That night? That night. Wow. Do you remember the episode mm-hmm. that you filmed? I don't, but people ask that all the time. I don't remember. I wish we could look back at that episode and be like, oh, what it's was going on? It's in the vault somewhere. Yeah. You hear me like, <laughs> oh, check it. I don't like sounds either. Hold please. Uh, oh my god! <laughs> that is wild. Yeah. So, were you ever yeah. able to record these episodes from your house? Like, if you just set up one of those, see that little audio yeah. recording thing? Well, that's all very new. Like, all this stuff now is very new. Mm-hmm. So, I would go in all the time. But during COVID, and I had a little booth, so I would do a lot of my own auditions at home. Um, for a long time, I've had a, my own little record for voiceover. Mm-hmm. But when COVID hit, everything stopped. And that's when Rugrats had gotten picked up for a reboot. And we started doing episodes before the COVID hit. Mm-hmm. And then I was in COVID and they're like, and we're like, oh no, we just started getting to do new Rugrats and it's so fun and so exciting. And we were all kind of bummed. And then all of a sudden, like after a few months, they called and said, do you have a booth set up at home? And I was like, I do. And I had just updated it. And I had just put this thing that I, it's a, uh, it's called um, Source Connect, where I can connect to a studio outside of mine. Hmm. And I had just gotten that all upgraded for some reason, which is miraculous. So then I was like, I do. And then all of a sudden they said, can we try to do some episodes at your place? And I was like, okay. So I started doing them at home. And actually then I moved to Malibu 
in a little place right on the beach. And I had this little booth I had it made for me. And I set it all up in there. I, I did, I think I did like 20 episodes at in Malibu in this little tiny beach nook um, during COVID. 20 of the brand new episodes were done at home in a little tiny. It wasn't even anything like that. Wow. It was literally like made of plexiglass with a little foam in it. And I threw a blanket over it. It's so great. That's really neat. It's really cool, right? And I did t- a lot of major Rugrat rug rat episodes in wow. that. Wow. Is there ever a time where you weren't able to film? And what would they do in those cases? Like, let's just say you had just given birth or something like that, and they have to get an episode out. Is there ever anything like that, or is it pretty laid back in terms of their schedule? And, it's pretty know, laid do- back, because if, let's say, I'm, let's say I'm had a baby, mm-hmm. and I needed a, you know... First of all, it's not that hard to just sit in a booth and do your lines, even if you just have a baby. I was that person that... Um, started working pretty quickly right away because I was known for just bringing the baby with me. Like I didn't want to, that was my only thing was I didn't want to leave my child and be working to where my kid wasn't getting what they needed. So I would just have like a nanny or an assistant and they'd sit right there outside the booth and then I would record and if I needed, they need me, I would just step out for a second and I was just like, so I never, it never compromised any of my personal life. Like I just could do it anytime. I could do voiceover most of the time. Mm. There wasn't, if I had a, a flu, like if I had a flu or something and I needed to wait, all oh, they just say, okay, well, we'll get you record next week. Mm. So we'll skip this week and we'll do your lines for this, this week, next week. So you'll do next week's and the week after together. So they just kind of move things around. It's like super chill. Mm. It's not like when you're filming a movie yeah, you and you're on location on there. and you have to be working with the other actors and like, if you can't show up, you're screwed. Right. Because the whole everything, yes, but voiceover, they can record you a week later. It's not going to make or break anything. Wow. If Graham were doing a voiceover for a cartoon character, what would the cartoon character look like? Wait, what? He would be really smart and I would make him talk a little faster. <laughs> and I would say that he'd say, listen, everyone, we have something really important we're going to negotiate here. That's what I would make you sound like. He does, he's a smart, fast that's talking. Cool. <laughs> that's really cool, I tell you. That's how I'd make him sound. Wow. And I'd make you sound more like a surfer guy. A I'd be like, guy? Listen, oh, dude, what are you talking about? Dude, what are you See, talking I mean, about? That's what I would have him do. Gnarly, man. That's yeah, gnarly. Like, dude, yeah. why don't you guys come over for a little while? We'll do something fun at my place. <laughs> that's crazy. Listen, you could see him look that's like pretty, that, I right? could see it. Huh. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I, really I'd fun. say that's pretty yeah. fitting right there. Yeah, that's one of my favorite games. My favorite games is like if you were to put 10 faces and let me hear 10 voices, I could to match pick the in voice the sign to there. the face. Yeah. That's my funny, funny little game. Yeah, I listened to a podcast where you're talking about making a voice of a pillow and how it would sound. Oh, it's like Kelly Clarkson. Yep. Yeah. And I thought it was so accurate. It was just like this really high pitch, yes, but very. This is a pillow and yes. she's fluffy and she talks like this. Everything is beautiful. Put your little bottom right here, you know? What goes through your mind when, when you see something like that and you put a, put a personality to it? Like, Oh, my God, you, it's so much fun. It's so much fun because you can make anything have a voice. Like this little plant could be like, oh, we're just sitting here in the sun and it's beautiful. <laughs> you know what I mean? And this one would be like, oh, yeah, I really like it here in the sun. It's a little bit bigger. Let's hang out here in the sun. Okay, let's just do that. What would this key sound like? <laughs> oh, the key would sound like this. Let's go. We're at Lexus. Let's put this in the car. I mean, he's skinny and little, so I would do his <laughs> It just depends. It's very fun. Oh, that it's is. Fun. I wish I had that yeah. skill. That sounds fun. It's really fun. It's you know, really I fun. wanted to be a voiceover actor did when I was you? a kid. I did. So uh, we'd get together with my buddies, mm-hmm. and uh, one of our friends had a cell phone. Mm-hmm. He was the only one whose parents would like not check the minutes. That's oh. when you had to pay by minute or oh whatever. Oh, my God. And so we used to make these prank phone calls and I would be the one doing the voices oh and we call like grocery stores. Did you do and that we, on YouTube? No. no, gosh, no. This was when uh, I was in like sixth grade, seventh grade, wow. eighth grade, like mm-hmm. somewhere around there. Uh-huh. Um, but yeah, so I would call up and I had this character, Ina Makrovich, Ooh, let's hear calling her. these grocery stores. Let me hear <clears> it. <throat> Hi, my name is Ina Makrovich. <laughs> uh, I'm calling because I left something at, uh, in the grocery store. Like, you know, that's I used really to. Good. Yeah, my voice got a little deep, but it no, used but to be better good. back then. It's like a lady, uh, I love it. Yeah, and then I used to call the school as my mom oh my to God, get out of school. See, and that's I called. great. Hi, my name is Pamela Stefan, calling on behalf of Graham. He's not feeling See, that's well. That's amazing. See, so I really good. wanted to get into voice Aww, acting. I just so thought cool. I had a. Love had a that. cool knack for it. No, yeah, that's so cool. Thank you. I love that. I actually did this voiceover seminar. I did two things you guys should check out mm-hmm. and get you a link for. I at least can get you a link for the one woman show, though. The voiceover seminar is somewhere. I can get you a link for that, too. But um, it was a voiceover seminar. And I did it because people would ask that. Be like, how do you do it? And 
I have a really cool voice. And he's like, it's not just about having a cool voice. You have to be able to read the lines like a real person. People like reading lines like, drinking water, don't, you're under the authority of the pub. You know, you have to be able to read it like it matters. But um, so I did do a seminar on voiceover because people would ask and I filmed it in front of a live audience. And it's, it's like, and I talked about the tips, tools, how to's, and it's pretty cool. And it's not expensive. I did it like a digital download thing so people can learn. And, and I also did like, which is really interesting is I actually interviewed a lot of the famous voiceover stars. Like, Mm -hmm. and I asked all of them, like, I talk about this in the seminar, but I asked a lot of like big pro guys, like how you got a break. It was really weird was none of them got a break like normal. Like it wasn't like, oh, I had an agent and I booked a job. Everyone was like, I was singing at a wedding. Someone heard my voice and said, you want to learn? I was in a play. Someone heard my voice. I was like, nobody hmm. went into voiceover like with the intention of voiceover. They just, well, I was a comedian. Someone heard me. Every single major voiceover star got it in some random way. It's really cool. Who's out there looking for voices? Is it that they work with TV and movies and they're just sent out to scout? Or are these people just going about their day and they I find mean, someone? Look, and- I did a play and yeah. some guy came to the play and was like, you're really good at your voices, your children's voices. He was a voiceover agent. So he happened to be at the play where I happened to be changing my voice around. And he's like, you should try this. So he's like, you never know. All I know is you, the more you're out there and the more you do things, the more you like say yes to things the more openings for opportunities come. Yeah. I guess it's the same for dating, right? I'm supposed to be going out more. You're supposed to be going out more? I think so, because I've been like, not, it's like, who wants to go out when it's raining? But yeah, if I want to find my next husband. Are you on the apps? I am. These, uh, these are our favorite topics to talk about. <laughs> I'm on the apps. Jack I might see you there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I am on those apps. It was driving me crazy. I'm not so good at them. I need. I need, I would have my assistant swipe for me because I'm just like my follow. Really? Is terrible. But does she know your taste? I mean, well, my uh, Julie's newer, so she. But my other assistant Ace, she kind of. She kind of has the same taste as me. But it's not just like the taste, like the type. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's not like the type thing. It's more like now at this point in my life, it's more like when you hear people talk about themselves nonstop and they don't ask you how you are, like narcissists. Mm-hmm. Like that's just like I'm highly allergic to narcissists. Like like I'm looking for different things now than I think I did when I was younger. Like now it's really like kind people, people that are love animals or kind. The emotional me. connection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People that are like, deeper yeah. and connected. So it's harder for me with apps because um, I can't, it's hard for me to just look at a picture now and read a few lines. Like, And then if I even get to where I have a conversation, usually they want to text and text and text and text. And I'm like, I don't want to text. If you want to just like have a quick FaceTime call, that would be better because then you could see someone and I'm super intuitive and I can see if like I'm, you know, for one, am I really attracted to them? For two, are they really hearing me? Do they really see me? Are they really connected or they're talking about things that matter or are they just like yo me and my buddies are going around in this boat want to come like whatever just oh like gosh. if there's something deeper yeah. like i love animals i've done a lot of <sighs> things or i don't know i just look for deeper things now and it's hard for me because um i see everything like i think i'm highly intuitive so i can see when someone's over trying to sell themselves and they're not really what they're saying yeah. they are and do you yeah. feel like maybe it's intimidating that they that they know who you are or do they not know? Because I feel like it, it would, yeah. If I meet someone and they go like, oh my God, I saw you on Valley Girl, you're my favorite. And I'm yeah. like, I can't date that guy because it's too weird because they're like fanning, it's fangirling and they're like, it's one thing if somebody's doing just as good in their career. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? If they're like their world, their life, their career is, they're doing well. So if they're just love what I do and they, and they want to know me and, and it's not like, they live in Pacoima on a boat dock and they're, they got a big fish in their picture. And <laughs> they're asking you to like move to Pacoima and go fishing with them every day. Like we have nothing in common. Yeah, so if we're yeah. like, <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? Like if we have a lot in common and like, I'm a big animal person, I'm, I'm an animal activist and I do a lot. And so like with somebody that loves animals, I'm like, that's good. I like people that love animals is that tells me a lot about someone and someone who does a lot of spiritual work that tells me a lot about something. Mm. And they kind of like, they would know how to walk a press line if they had to. But those are important things because I go to like big things sometimes. You know what I mean? Yeah. I go to like beautiful events. And so I don't want to like feel like the person I'm with is like completely freaked out by all of it. Mm-hmm. That just wouldn't be a match. So it's right. like weirder things I have to look for. 
And I just don't, you know. All right. But if they are a fan of your work, wouldn't that like signal? You? I'm a huge fan. But wouldn't that signal? He's though, got that, a fiance. I got a fiance. Oh, congrats. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, but Jack doesn't. Okay. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but if they're a fan of your work, uh-huh. wouldn't that also signal that, that they appreciate like what you do and like your backstory and your career? Yes. And, like, and that is nice. And yeah. actually that would be really beautiful as long as they were feeling great about what they did and they were thriving at what they did. I think if somebody's like, it, I think you just have yeah. to be each other's match or each sure. other's person. And I mean like comparable magnitude, the meaning like, you know, just both be doing, doing well in your life. You know what I mean? Or if you're both not doing well, but at least you match, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like for me, I don't want to, like I dated this guy who was a sweetheart and I really liked him, but, um, we, we really were, we were a match in some ways. It was like, mm. we were a very spiritual guy and we would go to some events and stuff and he was a really nice guy, but like he lived in a behind a house in a little hut under behind a house and a thing. And I was like, I can't, I can't go there. Yeah. It's just not, not like, it's not like trying to be superficial, but it's just trying to be like comparable magnitude. Like, you know what I mean? I've worked hard and I live a certain way and I don't want to all of a sudden like have to go from it's like, like an inequality match. That's all I mean. You, you should be yeah. like matched. match. Just like right. if somebody's has no spiritual life and they don't believe in God, that's fine. I do. And so that's a big disconnect. Yeah. So I think, there has to be like, there has to be matches across like important things. And to me, the important ones are like spirituality, love of animals, um, you know, a person who's not a narcissist who's just like, I think it's, it makes it hard. It does make it a little hard. Yeah. What's some of the best relationship advice you've ever heard? The best? I want to hear yours first. The best relationship ad- advice. <laughs> Jack's like, yeah, what? Got- uh, <laughs> well, that's not a question. I don't know if this often. is like, I mean, it's a pretty commonly agreed upon thing that communication is key. And I'm a firm believer that yeah, like, yeah, you should that's communicate great. everything. 100%. I think communication will solve 99.99% yeah. of problems in relationships. I think that's a great answer. Yeah. I love that. Yes. Hmm. Yes. yes. One yes. point for you. And I think laughter. I think being goof, be able to be goofy and have fun. I mean, oh, this guy's a big goof. How important, oh. how important is this to be a laugh? Yeah, like, yeah. I've had, I think to me, like being able to laugh is like whoever I end up marrying or being with my for the rest of my life partner person. Mm-hmm. I just wanted to be fun and funny and also sexy and hot. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like yeah, best sure. friend slash super hot for each other. That's it. Yeah, and great communication and like just a lot of like similar interests in the world and the real big world and the important things. Yeah. Cause work is like, work is beautiful and I'm grateful for my work, but it's not at the end of the day, y- you want to like feel safe with your people. Right. And your career is here and there and it goes up and down all the time or whatever. But at the end of the day, you want to feel safe in home at home, wherever home is. Yeah. When Rugrats was wrapping up, how did you feel uh, towards that? Were you ever nervous of like finding what the next thing was and, and, like progressing further with, for my job. Yeah. Yeah. Like the, were there times where, where I'm like wondering what my next move is going to be. Right. Because yeah, right now, I mean, I have jobs and I'm, I'm doing great and I thank God, but I do wonder like, because I feel I'm being called to something more big, something bigger. Mm -hmm. And I do really want to do a documentary. Um, because I've had a pretty interesting like journey with like, even just personally, like, my personal life. And it's not like I would want it to be a scandal thing, but there's been a lot of scandal in my life with, um, you know, it's like my ex-husband was married to Pam Anderson twice. My ex-husband was married to Shannon Doherty once. My ex-husband was the guy in the Paris Hilton tape. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But because of, for some reason, and not just that in my own life, other things, I've just had a lot of really wild things happen. So I have a very, and people I've dated, like, yeah. Could you share any of that? Like, like, what do you mean? Like, which like thing? any any stories with that I or mean, something that you w- would want to include I mean, in the I documentary? Like, okay, like when I was in my twenties, yeah. I was madly in love, and I I had this boyfriend whose name was John Eric Hexham, and he was this very very beautiful man, and he looked like you. Yeah, oh, thanks. There you go. <laughs> so don't well, worry, we don't you'll, know. If, you'll find your partner. Yeah, <laughs> and he was a very beautiful man, and uh, John Eric Hexham, and. Um, I was younger than him and I was madly in love with him. And um, I think I was 22 and he was working on a very big show at the time. And he put a prop gun up against his head and shot it. And it blew a piece of his skull the size of a quarter into the middle of his brain. No. Brain dead. And so that happened. 
and in a, in a prop gun. It was a is prop it, gun. It was is just that like, just a for the shooting a blank? Yeah, but a blank. Oh yeah, though yeah. A blank range. has a blank close range. If you put it here, it probably would be okay. But it was here. Did he? Did he intend to do damage, he was or was just this probably playing around? He was on the set, and they said he was playing around, and he put it oh. here, and the. The blank mm-hmm. has gunpowder, wax, and paper, and yeah. it's strong enough to shoot through a piece of his skull the size of a quarter to the middle of his brain. So oh my it basically gosh. took him out. And so like that was a very um, challenging time for me because I was only in my 20s, but he was my boyfriend. And it was weird. The whole thing was weird. And um, yeah, I mean, I just had some really, there was a lot of trauma. I've had some trauma yeah. and also had some amazing things. So life has just pretty, been a pretty crazy journey. And, you know, I've sh- I shared a lot about a lot of that in that one woman show I talked about. Mm-hmm. It's called Listen Closely and it's on digital. It's on Amazon, both the yeah. seminar and Listen Closely. Listen Closely is like a one hour, 15 minute, one woman autobiographical musical about my journey. So I feel like I'm supposed to do the documentary based on that one woman show. So if you guys see the one woman show, listen closely. There was a lot of things that happened. You, I do talk about the Paris Hilton thing and I do talk about the Shannon Doherty stuff. And I do talk about how I met my first voice agent and it changed my career. Mm-hmm. And I do talk about John Eric shooting himself in the head. I actually reenact that whole thing in the one woman show. So I try to just be really real about what happened and how my thought process was during a lot of it and how I just kept growing my spirit to be able to handle all this shit. Yeah, so I'm feeling like the next thing I'm supposed to do is either like this book or this documentary. Plus, there was a lot of stuff like around the Conrad Hilton, which is Paris Hilton's little brother. Mm. I mean, you could Google it and my family. There's a lot of drama around that. There's just been a lot of stuff. In the middle of that, I've had this beautiful career and and my love of animals. So I just think there's a lot of interesting things that I would want to share my side of what happened about a lot of things. Yeah. How did you cope through the, the shooting? Uh, um, that, Cause that I feel like is, is just a, is a tough one to grasp it because really it was like was. a bit of an accident, very spontaneous. It was kind of like a dream. Okay. It sort of felt like I was in a dream. I was like, I really almost couldn't believe it was happening. And then, but there were a lot of things that happened up until that, that yeah. kind of looking back, I was able to <clears> journal like, I felt like he was a ticking time bomb and he was going to mm. blow up. I mean, I like, I wrote it in journals. Like I feel like John Eric is a ticking time bomb and I don't know when he's going to go off. No. And then there was another weird thing that happened that I didn't remember till recently. I went and did ayahuasca, which I don't do drugs really. I don't yeah. know if you guys know what ayahuasca is. I do. Yeah. I don't, I don't do drugs. I've never done, I don't really do any drugs and I'm not a drinker. Mm-hmm. That's never my thing, but I did go do ayahuasca because there's so many amazing things I kept researching about it. And in that, I had a very vivid memory of when I was with John Eric in his room, in his bed, and I couldn't stop crying. And it was like it was happening. I was during the ayahuasca, when I was on ayahuasca, and I was just remember, I was just crying, crying, crying. It was like, and he was right there with me. And I remember it was like yesterday. And what was really weird was he died a week later, and I couldn't remember that when I was... Uh, I didn't know why I was crying when I was actually with him in real life a week before he died. And now I look back and I was like, I must have known something. Like I knew something was going to happen. I wrote the thing. He's, you know, there's just a lot of really yeah. weird things. Just- what what made you want to do ayahuasca? What what about that piqued your curiosity? Because I've seen a lot of documentaries Me on too. it and hearing people's experiences. And yeah. it's, it's interesting, but I would be, I feel like I'd be terrified. Terrified. Yeah. Okay. That's why I did it. Because for one, my daughter had done it. When my younger daughter did it, she kept calling me every night after her ceremonies and be like, mom, this is mind boggling. Like there's a lot of people just like you. There's women your age who have had adult kids who have had lives and they're very like, you know, there, there's so many people just like you, normal, regular people, not drug addicts, not this, not that. And I kept mm-hmm. thinking, yeah, but I'm terrified. I, first of all, I don't like to throw up. Right, yeah, I mean, that's one do, of the first things, right? You just I like do you throw not up? like yeah. throwing up. So it's like, uh, do not, I cannot. And so I kept saying, no, honey, I could never do that, but I'm glad you're having a good experience. And my daughter, for her, was very healing. And um, and so, and the place she went to was very, very high end, and they really educate you there. You have to do classes about it before you even do ayahuasca, and then you do four days in a row. But you know- Four days in a row of ayahuasca. Five, four days in a row. That and seems, so, is that healthy? <laughs> 
It, it's fine. It's, oh, wow. It's, Poor it's fine. Days. They have like medics and a medical yeah. team. You have to see the doctors. Is this, this isn't in the United States, no. right? In Costa Rica. That's where I did it. And how long does the ayahuasca trip last? I mean... I don't think it's long, it's, right? It, the, first, like, you, the first three nights you go in and you start... There, the ceremony is like music and singing and like chanting. You could start at seven and then you're there to like one or two in the morning. What, 7 what p.m.? The, yeah. And what are the demographics of the people? Everyone. Like? I mean, there were like conservative like couples from like that have a, a cow farm, like really conservative, like they go to church. They're like super conservative couples that were there. I was like, what are they doing here? And then there were like moms and there were like young girls and were like older people and there was like older men like in their late 70s. I mean, it was really wide, wide demographic. It wasn't like, oh, it was a bunch of wanting to be sober out yeah. because there's a lot of healing properties. So it was really wild. But so when my daughter came back from that trip. She said, mom, you should really think about it. I was like, no, I can never do that. It scares, the, it scares me so much. And then I just kept thinking about it and I kept researching and I researched this guy, Gabe Mate, this doctor. And he said like, he's never seen so much healing in his patients. And he had, he had dealt with uh, people that were dying and he dealt with people that were terrible addicts. And he says he's never seen the kind of recovery or healing that came from ayahuasca. So it was like, and they kept saying, like, if it's calling to you and it keeps calling to you, then you got to listen because hmm. that's how mother ayahuasca works. And so then I finally said to my daughter, yeah, I'll do it. I couldn't believe I said it and I couldn't believe I did it. And I did four days of it. Did you go room. alone? I went with my daughter again. She went again. This was months later. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, it was wild. How much does it cost for a four day trip of that? Well, this this place I went to is like really nice. It's called Rhythmia. It's like a little bougier, but I wanted that because I wanted it to be like very safer, intimate, really yeah. safe. You have to see the medic's office. You you have to do health forms. You have to eat a certain diet. It's very strict. It's a medicine, mm -hmm. and so um, you know I don't know what that place is like six seven thousand for a week per person. Yeah, but but you're it's there. for four days. It's no, it's a week. Oh, it's a you week? You do like, oh, you do breath work, you do meditation, you do yoga, you do... Oh, wow. So it's a whole retreat? It's a whole retreat. And one of the activities that you do on the retreat is the ayahuasca. Yeah. Aside from and that, the, it's meditation. That's and right. And the last night of ayahuasca you do from like 7 p.m. till the next day. You're literally, you watch the sun come up and you wake up and you're, you don't wake up, you're just like... You're awake through the night. But are you around sober people? Like there are people, like if you... Oh, yeah. Did you oh, see yeah. people like freaking out a little bit? You're in bit, a giant or? room, like... A giant room, like a, with sixty a hall, people, a massive. probably sixty people. You're all in the same room. So yeah. you, Vsauce had a great documentary on it. He went and did exactly this and filmed the entire thing. I think I saw that one. Yeah, I watched all a bunch really of them because I wanted interesting. To, but yeah. I didn't. I didn't know. Like, to me, I I really wanted to hear people's stories that never did drugs because I was that person. I was like, I want to hear from somebody who was never a drug addict. Mm -hmm. That's that's what I was looking for online. And I couldn't find a lot of those. I don't know if I found any. No. Because that scared me. I was like, it's one thing if you've done drugs and you're used to being out of your mind. But it's another if you're never done drugs and that scares me. How did you find it to be healing? Like in what way? Oh, it's just so... Like I'm saying, it, it takes you to part of your brain that you can't really tap back into usually. Breath work you can do it with, mm -hmm. but... Like I was able to go back to that moment lying in that bed mm -hmm. with my boyfriend who shot himself. And mm -hmm. I remembered like a message, like his message was, um, I believe in you. Go do this, th go do these things you want to do. Like, cause he was like the big star at the time. He had this series and I was like, I was doing my own career, but I remember like there was beautiful messages and I did, I went ahead and, and followed through. Like, it's almost like he said, you can do this. And that was way back at the beginning of my career. Mm. And I remembered things about my mother that like, it was hard for me to connect with my mom all the time. For some reason, my mom is a beautiful lady and was a good mom, but she was very like, she'd look at me, she'd be like, what, why is your hair messy here? What's going with that eyebrow or whoa? Oh. It wasn't like looking at me like, I love you. It was like, she, she had a hard time really seeing deep. It was more like yeah. she would, great mom still, but just couldn't see me inside me, mm -hmm. which was painful for me because I always just want to be seen. I want people to see me. And so one of the messages I got was that in my ayahuasca, because you're like tripping, but you remember everything. You literally remember yourself throwing up in a bucket. You remember yourself crawling to the bathroom. You remember, like you remember, you're, like usually when you're drunk, you black out, you don't remember. Yeah. Not that I ever do that, but people when they're really messed up, they don't remember anything. Right. You remember everything during ayahuasca. 
And so one of the messages was, like a shaman lady would ask me, like, what are you feeling? I'm like, I feel really nauseous. She's like, what is that? I'm like, it's fear. She goes, what is that fear? I'm like, I'm just scared of everything. And I just started sharing all these things, but I'm crying, crying, crying. And then I just said, and I'm afraid, like, my mom's getting older and I'll never get to really have her see me. And I just start crying, like crying, deep crying. And then all of a sudden she goes, do you want to dance with your mom? And all of a sudden I'm dancing with the shaman lady, but it's actually like, I'm feeling like it's my mother, but my mother young and me young. And I'm crying and I'm like wow. connecting to my mother. And then when I come back to town after ayahuasca, my mom is so present and I feel her like I've never felt her. And I don't know how that worked, but something shifted from the ayahuasca for me. And when I see my mom now, it's a very different, weird thing. It's just weird. Do you think it's because you're behaving and seeing things differently? Or do you think Yeah, because that, I had this revelation that my yeah. mom has always been able to connect with babies. And that came from the ayahuasca. What's the message was, your mom connects to babies and children. She sees them. She has a hard time with adults. For whatever reason, maybe they were too painful for her. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, my mom could connect and love children and babies. Like she just loves them. Mm -hmm. She had five kids, but adults probably scared the shit out of her. So um, I realized that in order to connect with my mom, I connect with her like she sees the little kids. So it's mm. like, I don't know what happened. Just something, yeah. there was a weird revelation about my mom that was profound. So what's your relationship with work look like now? Are you still very gung-ho about work? You're still very excited to take on more jobs and continue working for the next five, 10, 15, 20 years? Or, or what's your sentiment? I'm going to be an old lady. <laughs> and I'd like to make it big in Hollywood. <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> the next 25 years. Yes, well, let me tell you. Uh, who, who are yeah. the grandparents on Rugrats? Boris, Oprah. Boris, and uh, what was yeah. <laughs> Boris was... and Minka. Minka, yeah. you could be Minka. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be doing my Oprah. Oprah? I remember when I used to watch you. Oh, oh like, my Sounds like a little gosh. bit like Cher. Cher half read. Yeah, Cher talks like this. Anyway, I still really want to keep doing beautiful. I feel like there's so many messages and things I've learned that I want to find ways to put them out. You know what I mean? If I can spare someone some of the things I did, I want to do that. I feel like there's so many different voices I could still do. There's so many roles I still want to do. So there's a lot of like things I still want to do. I really do want to do, do a documentary because I have all the old footage of me like performing back in the 80s when I would do like the Sunset Strip and the whiskey and the, all those clubs back then. And just like I have, you know, videos of like, I videotaped everything back then. So mm. I want to use all the live footage. And so I really want to do that. I have to find the right person to help me, like a person to help me put it together because it's too much by myself. But, you know, like a team that does documentaries. So I'm going to do that. That's one of my goals. And I think I want to write the, a book. And there's other roles I want to do that are like just dope and cool and... And voiceover, it's limitless. You know, yeah. there's so many different voices I, I want to play with. But so, yeah, I still feel a drive. I mean, I definitely um, feel like the last two years were kind of chill for me. Um, even though I was working, I was doing Rugrats and other shows. One's called Grimsburg. I still think there's some other really cool things I want to do. And and more speaking and more teaching and more um, more fun and more yeah. funny and more love. Yeah. And more How were stuff. you and what were your thoughts about like saving and investing? throughout the entire process. Was there any concern of like, oh, I don't know how long this is going to last. I better save it like just in case. Cause I hear a lot about the industry could either be like, you're doing really well one year and then there's yeah, no work for a yeah. while. And oh, really yeah. well. You can make money one year and then yeah. not at all the next. I mean, there were times where like I'd have to move out of my house and go, when my kids were little, we moved out of our house and went to go live at the Oakwoods cause I was running out of money. The Oakwoods is like this apartment complex that a lot of people would go stay at when they were filming a show or they'd bring their little families and stay in these little apartments. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of fun. It was a lot of industry people. But there were times where I had to move out of my house and and take the kids when they were little and because I was like, oh, shit, I'm running out of money. you know. And then everything just fly back and all of a sudden be making money again. So I am very aware about saving and um, being smart with money. And um, I'm... Uh, you know, I do have to, you do have to think about it. Cause like I have money, but would I feel like if I want to just retire and stop doing everything right now, I don't think I would feel ready to do that. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Financially? Yeah. I don't think so. I think I'd like to do some jobs that were like just really super big money to where I really don't even have to think about it. But right mm -hmm. now I think I would want to be more stable there. Sure. Yeah. Where are you investing? 
I hate stocks and all that stuff. Yeah. Like, I literally like the only money I put into stocks or into, I don't know what those are. I don't even know what they're called. Index funds. It's with USB. What is that USB? Is that USB? Anyway, USDC? <laughs> no, I don't know. Jack. All I know <laughs> is like options? The, all, the only money I've yeah. ever put is like a little chunk of dough. I would yeah. put into that. Like that money is down by 15 or 20%. And it's been in there From, for two years. So I'm like. Wait, wait. It's, so yeah, it's down 15% years. over two years? In the last, like, whatever, since they I put it in, it's down from what the actual the value The whole market is. has gone down. Yeah. Tell me about it. Not, you guys tell not, me about that. Not over two years. I may be... Down year, over two years? Is yeah, it a yes, year? So mm. the S&P is down about 10% year over year. Okay. Over two no. years, it's positive. So... Right now, it's it it's whatever I Over put two years? It, yeah. Okay, then maybe it's been a year. But whatever money I took and I put it in this thing, it was like, you should do that and then I'll invest that for you, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. It's down, which means like I'm, every time I've ever put money in any of those things that are play the market, is always down. And anytime I was like, I think I need that. They'd be like, oh, it's down by this much. And I'd be like, I need it. And I told you to put it in nothing unless it was really conservative and I wasn't going to lose and it'd be down. So I like have no faith. I think you just got to hold on a little bit longer. I mean, the, overall the market saw a pretty big dip over the past year. When's so. it going up? Do you have the I mean, no, no, let me check. No, uh, well, <laughs> did well today. There's no did golden really well like today. date yeah. basically where you can expect it to go up by. Yeah. But then what? Then yeah. it goes up and then it's two years later it goes down. So you never really make yeah. any money with well, the, it. Well, the I mean, average is about seven to eight percent a year over 20 up? years. No, historically, it's about 10 percent a year. For 20 it's not. Years. No, it's no adjusted nice. for inflation. Uh, sure, we did, you didn't specify that. Just but yes, adjusted seven to eight percent a year. I would do a cartoon voice where you just said adjusted for inflation. Don't talk about it. I would do a little kid with like, hey, let's talk about inflation. Year. Let's talk about inflation. <laughs> seven to eight percent a year, Jack. Seventy-eight percent a year, Jack. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, adjusted for inflation, it's seven to eight percent per year. But if not, it's ten. And for Rugrats, do you continue to get royalties? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, you do. Well, then you that's get, a that's get, a retirement. You do. It's I mean, great. That's like, and uh, you get royalties from like, I'm good. I'm fine. I could retire. If I yeah. Were. I mean, I. You get royalties from like two and a half men. I did like wow, took me yeah. like. 50, 20 minutes to record that song and I get gigantic royalties on that song and I didn't even write the song but it's um, in syndication that show so it's just a really big money thing yeah who would thought you know I did that so long ago but it's great yeah. Chuck Lorre has good projects one of the stories that sticks with me for a theme song is yeah. uh, Danny Elfman who wrote um, the Simpsons theme song did it in the car in 15 minutes yeah submitted Can you it imagine? and that's it the well, Simpsons that's how it theme is. Song. Yeah, when it's really good, and it, it took me 15, 20 minutes to cut the men, 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 yeah. men, 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 men. That. It's so funny. I, I didn't realize until recently that you were the voice for that intro. Yeah. But I always wondered because his singing was too good. Like, there's no way. I thought maybe it's like because he did you it. You could sing it like this, but he <laughs> can't really sing very good. So, yeah. Men, 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 men. I had to sing him. <laughs> I always thought maybe it was just like really auto tuned and they used him and like just like fix the voice because it was like too good. That was the magic of me. No. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Can you do the voice of Chucky? Can you imitate? I don't do Chucky, no. But can you do any of the voices? Like, can you? Because you're so good at, at picking other characters and like doing it. Could you or no? Uh, you know, it's really funny. Chucky, I don't really do. Huh. I really don't do it. Um, there was a time on the show where I did one of the other characters. I can't even say what, because I had a little issue. But um, uh, I did do one other character on that show, just one or two episodes, because the person wasn't available or something. But um, I don't want to like... It was probably supposed to be on the down low, but sure. I did do that, one of the characters once. Um and, uh, but like, yeah, I don't do Chucky, which is really funny. Yeah. There's once in a while, there'll be a voice I don't do. I mean, I don't do men's voices, obviously, you know, yeah. but I used to do like, I did, uh, Mrs. Impossible. Dash, you have to get over on that. You know, what's her name? She does Dash. Oh, it's, Helen Hunt. That's It's crazy. Holly, Holly Ho Hunter. Yeah. Ho Dash, I want yeah. you to tell your dad something. You know, she talks like that. Yeah. So I actually did wow. Mrs. Impossible for all the like, pickups and the commercials to do a Thai commercial. And uh, so I do things like that. Like they say, can you do Holly Hunter's voice? And I was like, yeah. no, I can't do that. She sort of talks like this. And I was like, I can't do it. But then I did it. And then I was like, I guess I can do it. Well, they will say, can you do share? So I'll be like, oh, honey, I'm not sure how to do it. You know, so I tried to do share, you know, <laughs> snap out of it. That chair. Yeah, that was that's recent. good. 
That's pretty good, right? Oh my god! Yeah, so I do that, but it's a weird thing. So it, certain voices, yes, and there might be a voice here and there I don't. And I don't do Chucky. Hmm. Yeah, but Nancy does great. How often do people ask you to do Tommy Pickles? All the time. Really? Yeah. Do you ever get tired of I it? I have like workers at my house and they'll be like, oh, you do Tommy Pickles? And I'll be like, yeah, and then I'll do it. No, not really. It, it's pretty sweet. It's pretty sweet, you know? You see yeah. them like light up like, oh, right. God, you're the voice of my childhood. I mean, like if I'm like, um, if I'm at a restaurant, I'm eating dinner with somebody or, you know, and somebody walks over the table and is like, oh, can you do the voice? I'm like, man, I'm on a date. <laughs> can we do this? <laughs> it's probably not a good time. You get asked that while you're on a date? I mean, there'll be times when people walk up to you at a table like, oh my God, I, I know you. And they're very sweet. And I always wow. try to be very gracious. Yeah. But sometimes I'll have to say, I'm on a date, so it's not really appropriate for me. So I'll have to say that, but I try to be nice because they're Your sweet. date doesn't encourage you. Oh, no, no, it's okay. Go ahead. Sometimes. Go ahead. He wants the exact same thing. <laughs> Sometimes. He, he said, I've been waiting I mean, this entire time you know, for this moment. Yes, you I already think, set them up to ask the question. Yeah, before. right? Yeah, he set it up. <laughs> no, I mean, sometimes just to be sweet to people, you don't want to make people feel terrible. I don't like making people feel bad. It's hard yeah. enough for them to walk up and say, right. you're the voice of my childhood, and yeah. that is a gift to me. But just sometimes there might be like, I might be in the middle of something and it's really a bad time. I might just say, oh, I'm just in the middle of something. It's yeah. not a good time for me, but thank you. You know, just want to be gracious. Yeah. Is but there maybe. anything else that you want to talk about? Anything else that we, you feel like we didn't hit? I think really, honestly, you guys should watch the Listen Closely. Okay. It's the one woman autobiographical musical. It's on Amazon. And the one woman, oh, I do have the voiceover seminar, which is pretty cool. Okay. And I did have like some guest people come and talk about voiceover and I did share some interesting facts about voiceover. It's really kind of interesting. Cool. And I talk about my journey a little bit too. And because I really think a lot of the journey is, is, is being open. And I talk about offshoots, like be open to like somebody trying to point you to something new that you might say no to. And again, it is a fine line. Like we talked about it. You mm -hmm. might, you might say no to, I did say no one time I got offered a part in a Chuck uh, Norris movie to play his daughter in something. And I remember that I was like, I'm not doing Chuck Norris movie. You know, I passed on it mm -hmm. and I was so sad I passed on it because they were in Calgary filming Riding Horses and I was home in the summer doing nothing because I had no other jobs that came that summer and I thought mm -hmm. I was going to have like... So sometimes it's like I find more opportunities come by saying yes. Do you know what I mean? So I talk about things like... I talk about different kinds of things, but I like to teach people things other than just how to do voices about life so that it's life and art. And it's not just like you're doing your work and you're obsessed with your work. Because I oh. did obsess with my work, and that's not a fun way to live. Oh, that sounds like me. Yeah? <laughs> but he I loves like it, it, though. I like he loves it. it. So you're getting gay now, so you're says. doing something else, too. Yeah. Well, I'm doing both, but it's like, good. but I love work. For I me, mean, that's I, my escape, is just like it. loving work. And yeah. I do, too. I do, too. But um, I think um, if you have a box, and you have like nine squares, mm -hmm. and you have like work, and your fiance, and you animals and your His aquarium. fun and your oh, family aquarium. and your aquarium yeah. and your blah, blah, blah. And you put them all in a box that your life should be balanced. And it shouldn't be like 99% just the work and then you give a tiny bit. I just think no. this needs to be balanced for it all to really be good. I always feel like it, it can't be balanced. It's got to be like, if you want to excel at one thing, you have to be like more overweight. Yes, and, that's true. There yeah. are times where you want to be a little intense, but it, it'll make you crazy. I mean, yeah. the thing is you don't want to get to where you're just you feel like an empty shell, which is what I've experienced where I was so obsessed with making my work happen that I couldn't say no to people. I did things I didn't want to do. I went places I didn't want to go. Everything was for work. And I think I would want to encourage people to, um, to not give up yourself so much. Okay. You know what I mean? It's one thing to be ambitious, which is cool and be driven, but don't give up your integrity to yourself. And that's the difference. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. If I said yes to things I didn't want to do or yes to hanging out with people I didn't want to hang out with because I thought I could get an opportunity with that person and then I was like, things happen I didn't want to have happen, then I'd be like, that's that's a line you, you shouldn't cross. You should, I feel for myself, I would take better care of myself. Well, thank you so much. You're Is welcome. there anything else? Uh, we'll link to everything that you mentioned yeah. in the description. So like TikTok, all that will be TikTok, Instagram, there. Real EG Daily, yeah. Facebook, EG Daily, Twitter. I don't really do much Twitter, but EG I like the real, TikTok. It's Real EG Daily on TikTok and cool. Instagram. And my website, EGDaily.com. Cool. It's kind of fun. Well, it'll all be in the description. Thank, thank you, you so for, much. Again, look out for Scream and Cry and New Rugrats and Grimsburg, which I do with John Hamm, who's a great actor. And yeah, it's going to be fun. Good stuff. Thank you. I appreciate it. You're welcome. All right. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Cool. Now we've got contact. Thank you. Although, you know what? While we're on the topic of being a creator, I got to say, 
I know how overwhelming it could be to see all the equipment that's out there and think, oh, I got to spend thousands of dollars to get started up. But thankfully, our sponsor, StreamYard, is there to help. So StreamYard is a live streaming studio platform that helps you create high quality content with just the click of a button. All you need is any camera and an internet connection, and you can start streaming directly from your browser. What I really like, though, is that you could stream to multiple social media platforms all at the same time. So you could set it up once and then stream to YouTube, to Twitch, to Instagram, and and so on. Basically, almost anything out there, you're going to get your face out there. StreamYard is the best way to start creating content online. And best of all, they also offer a free package so you guys can get started today at the cost of zero. And look, leveling with you guys, they've also been a huge supporter of the podcast and have allowed us to take a lot of trips and travel to some of the guests that we otherwise just wouldn't have really seen. So if you guys appreciate that and want to support us and have something that's totally free, visit StreamYard down below in the description to get started today. Thank you so much, StreamYard. We love you. And back to the episode.